Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello, I am Saurabh Sharma, Assistant Professor in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Chanakya University, Bengaluru. We are doing Introduction to Chinese Studies. Today is the 14th lecture, India-China Relations, Hindi-Chini Bhai Bhai and 1962 War. Let us first look at the boundary dispute, summarize it a bit uh, as we had done this before in the last lecture. So, India became independent on the 15th of August 1947. Before that, India was ruled by the British government. And the Chinese Communist Party came to power on 1st of October 1949. So, the boundary dispute between the two countries precede both the entities coming to uh, into existence. That is the Republic of India or in the beginning the do Dominion of India uh, followed by the Republic of India and the People's Republic of China. So, the boundary dispute preceded both of them. Uh, so, the boundary dispute basically are in the th in three sectors, the uh, eastern sector and the western sector and the middle uh, sector. Middle sector is not very significant, mainly the dispute is around the uh, eastern sector and western sector. So, let us look at the two of them. Uh, first, let us look at the eastern sector. Now, this is a map uh, from the Shimla convention of 1914. Okay, this convention was signed by the Tibetan government and the British government and they agreed on a boundary between Tibet and India on the eastern sector. That boundary is known as McMahon line. Now, Chinese government refused to sign this particular treaty. But at that time, 1914, the Tibetan government was de facto independent. Okay, so, uh, let us see what, what the convention did. The yellow line here, you can see, this is the McMahon line. Uh, it, it goes into this green line also. So, this is the boundary. So, north of this yellow line is the area which was called as Outer Tibet. And south of this line is today the Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh. The, the line here uh, from here to here, this is the boundary between, uh, between China and Burma or Myanmar. Okay, because at that time, Burma was a province of India. It became a, it, it, it was separated from India in 1937. So, in 1914, it was still a province of India. So, the McMahon line extends into Myanmar. Now, uh, between this blue line and the red line, this area was called Inner Tibet. And China practically annexed this into its own territory. Outer Tibet was supposed to remain autonomous with neither the British nor the Chinese interfering in the inter internal affairs. While the British would continue to maintain their uh, whatever trading rights they have and uh, the troops uh, there to protect the trading rights as well as to prevent outside powers from interfering in Tibet. This was part of the great game between the Russian Empire and the, and the British Empire. So, the British to ensure that uh, no external power interferes in Tibet and thus threatens its colony in India, uh, established certain military uh, positions within Tibet. And the Chinese were not supposed to send their military into Tibet except as, as, as guards for their officials who would visit uh, Tibet from time to time. But the British recognized that Tibet was a part of China that was recognized by the Shimla Convention. So, this basically defined the boundary between India and China in 1914. In the western sector, the situation was different because there was no treaty between the 
two countries. In fact, there is no treaty still between the two countries. Uh, certain uh, British surveyors tried to draw a line that would divide the Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir from from China. Okay, or or uh, you can say Tibet. Partially, it's Tibet. Partially, it's the Xinjiang province of China. Now there are two main lines uh, that are uh, the part part of the dispute. The first line is the Johnson Ardak line. Okay, the Johnson line. Here you can see this line is uh, the 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 official basically the boundary of India that recognized by the Indian government. This is the Johnson Ardak line. This is the maximum territory claimed by India. Okay. This line includes Aksai chain. This is Aksai chain. Aksai chain within Indian territory because Jammu and Kashmir state signed the instrument of accession to India. So, since Jammu and Kashmir became part of the dominion of India, Aksai chain also became part because uh, the, the kingdom of Jammu and Kashmir or the state of Jammu and Kashmir recognize the Johnson line as its official boundary. In fact, I, I in the last lecture, I showed certain maps in which even the Chinese uh, uh, government accepted the Johnson line. Uh, they can argue that the, at that time, the Chinese government was weak and it was in no position to claim Aksai Chin and therefore, uh, these maps are issued, but uh, they were issued. The other line is the mccartney mcdonald line. This is the green line here. You can see this is the green line. Now, this line exclude Aksai Chin from uh, Indian territory. Okay. So, in the 1930s when the Chinese government you know became a bit more assertive, this was a time when uh, uh, Japanese also had began to invade uh, China. So, from that time onwards, China started printing maps showing the, the mccartney mcdonald line as the boundary between the two countries with Aksai Chin being part of China. Indian government uh, never really recognized this, uh, although the British were not uh, entirely sure what would be the boundary. Okay, this was not directly ruled by the British that you must understand. It was ruled by the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir, this territory. So, uh, the, unlike the McMahon line, there was no treaty between the British and the Chinese with regards to the western sector. Okay, so this is the uh, this is a brief background on the boundary dispute. Now, uh, when the two countries became independent, India became independent from the British, and the Communist Party came to power in uh, uh, China, they followed two different lines because it it, it was uh, dependent on the ideological differences. India was ruled by Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister. Now he was a member of the Indian National Congress influenced by uh, Gandhi who was uh, who believed in non-violence and therefore his, he, his approach to foreign policy was that of cooperation and taking a moral line. He also believed that because India led this kind of a non-violent movement against the British, it was an example for rest of the uh, colonized countries to, to follow. And he believed that India would be the leader of the third world countries. On the other hand, China was led by Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong was a communist. Okay. So, Mao uh, basically won power through war. He defeated Chiang Kai-shek. You can see this is Chiang Kai-shek and this is Mao Zedong. Chiang Kai-shek was the leader of China during the Second World War and once Japanese were defeated, his government, the Republic of China was the legitimate government. But the communists with the help of the Soviet Union were able to defeat the Kuomintang. The Americans tried to mediate, but it failed and eventually the communists came to power. And so Mao Zedong was a war leader. Okay, he, 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 he believed in use of violence. In fact, he said that power grows from the barrel of a gun. Okay, so, he believed that power was essentially violent and he did not believe in any non-violence. So, Chinese state was an expansionist state. Uh, Mao, Mao, Mao often said that China should become the center of gravity in Asia. So, he wanted to project China as a 
a military power, a revolutionary power, which wants to lead Asia through force, through, uh, through uh, its, its military prowess. On the other hand, Jawaharlal Nehru believed that India was a rising star in Asia. Okay, so it was like a something like a, a, a show, showing direction to the uh, to Asia how to achieve freedom, lead by example, not by force. That was the idea. Now what happened? Once uh, China came under communist rule, they first invaded Tibet. Okay, this happened in October 1950. Uh, Tibetans fought against the People's Liberation Army, that is the uh, army con of the Communist Party. But Tibetans were no match. Tibetans were technologically backward and they did not have much fighting experience. And so they were defeated by the PLA. But the Chinese wanted to claim that it was a peaceful liberation of Tibet. Okay, therefore, once uh, the main uh, army was defeated, they, they negotiated with the ruler of Tibet who was the Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama who was a young man at that time. And uh, uh, you know India did not intervene. So India was advising Tibetan government, the British were also advising them, but uh, uh, they did not intervene in order to protect the clauses of the Shimla convention. because. In the Shimla Convention, the British had guaranteed the Tibetan government that they will protect their autonomy in case, say, the Chinese tried to you know, violate that autonomy. And, and the Chinese were not supposed to send uh, their army into, into Tibet or the outer Tibet because inner Tibet was already annexed. So this was the outer Tibet. And, and so the Chinese were not supposed to send their army, but they did. While India did not intervene, India India felt that they should not because Nehru had the peace, kind of a peaceful policy. He did not want to fight a war. Although India fought a lot of wars in, 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 as soon as it became independent, like the war in Jammu and Kashmir, the war in Hyderabad and so on. But uh, uh, Nehru did not intervene. As a result, the Tibetans had to accept the Chinese conditions and China was able to annex Tibet. At that time, the Chinese had declared their peaceful intention towards, towards India. They said that India and China have no boundary disputes. So once uh, uh, negotiations were over, 17 point agreement was signed between Tibet and China. So these are some of the points in the uh, 17 points. I have not mentioned all of them. The first five were remove imperialist forces from Tibet. Now, what these imperialist forces are basically, it refers to the Indian uh, uh, troops and, 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 and advisors in Tibet. Then second, welcome the PLA, the People's Liberation Army should be welcomed into Tibet. Thirdly, national regional autonomy to Tibet. On, on, the, on the Chinese side, they guaranteed that they will only control the foreign policy and the defense of Tibet and they will allow internal autonomy. And the status quo would remain. Tibet won't have a communist system of government, but Dalai Lama would continue to rule over Tibet as the head of the government. On the other hand, they also included a, a, a point saying that the Pancham Lama, the 10th Pancham Lama would also continue in his position. Now this is interesting because Pancham Lama and the Dalai Lama were kind of rivals and, and uh, Pancham Lama in 1949 had joined the communists. Basically, he had expressed his support for the communists. And, and, and so, this was a kind of a check on the power of the Dalai Lama. Uh, so, uh, there are other points in, 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 the, in this agreement, including preservation of Tibetan religion, language and way of life, integration of Tibetan forces with the PLA. So, all the Tibetans who fought against the PLA should join the PLA. And then they guaranteed that there would not be any land reforms in Tibet without the agreement of the Tibetan government while the foreign policy and defense would remain under the Chinese central government. Okay, so Dalai Lama reluctantly accepted this agreement. Now, although Jawaharlal Nehru was uh, very keen on friendship and peace with China, 
Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel, who was the Deputy Prime Minister and the Home Minister of India, was very worried about uh, the Chinese occupation of Tibet. And he wrote a very famous letter to Jawaharlal Nehru on uh, 7th of November 1950. It is said that it was actually drafted by uh, Girija Shankar Vajpayee, who was the head of the Foreign Service. And so, uh, it was a criticism of the Indian ambassador to uh, People's Republic of China, K. M. Panikar, who was a communist and he always sent favorable reports of the uh, Chinese to the, to the Indian government. He said that the Chinese did not have any ulterior motives and they were very genuine uh, because he himself was a communist and he sympathized with the Chinese government. So, Sadar Patel basically criticized K. M. Panikar. Now, uh, the, the letter that he wrote to Nehru contains certain important points. Let me read out some of them. Number one, a military and intelligence appreciation of the Chinese threat to India. Okay, so, there must be an overhaul of the whole uh, military and in intelligence network that India has. Second, redisposition of our forces. So, there might be a need to uh, station our troops on the India-China boundary in order to counter a new threat because till then the threat was basically from the Pakistan side that too in Jammu and Kashmir and uh, there was no threat from uh, the Chinese side because Tibet was uh, de facto independent and there was no China on India's boundary. So, there was no threat and now with China reaching India's boundaries, so it was necessary to reposition our troops there. Third is re retrenchment plans for the army. Okay, this is a similar kind of a point. Then assure supplies of arms, ammunition and armor. So, Indian army needs to be equipped with uh, modern weapons. The weapons that Indian army used were belong to the second world war period and so there was a need to rearm the Indian forces uh, taking into account the new Chinese threat and the Chinese PLA was a large army. Okay, so, the size also mattered. So, in order to counter that the size of the of the PLA, there was a need to provide new armaments to the Indian soldiers. Then India should reconsider China's en entry into the United Nations. So, at that time, People's Republic of China was not a member of United Nations. It did not have a permanent seat in the United Nations Security Council. That seat was actually given to the Republic of China which was ruled by Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek, uh, once he was defeated by the communist, he and his government migrated to the island of Taiwan. S from there, he claimed to be the ruler of whole of China and his government was known as Republic of China. So, it was the Republic of China government of Chiang Kai-shek and his political party, Kuomintang, that had a permanent seat in the United Nations Security Council. Now, many countries like Soviet Union, and India advocated that it is the People's Republic of China that deserved a seat in the UN Security Council and not the Republic of China. Now, Sadar Patel argued that because China has occupied Tibet, India should reconsider its support to the People's Republic of China's membership of UN. Because, uh, in, in fact, th this was also at a time of the Korean War. And in the Korean War, Chinese PLA faced the United Nations forces. North Korea had invaded South Korea. North Korea was communist. South Korea was, uh, uh, say, capitalist or aligned towards the West. And uh, the United Nations passed a resolution that it was an aggression by North Korea into South Korea. Soviet Union at that time was boycotting the United Nations uh, uh, because it was demanding a Chinese seat. And, and, and so, uh, it, it was boycotting it and so, it did not, it was not able to exercise its veto power. And so, the UN forces led by the United States drove the North Koreans from South Korea. In fact, uh, they, they, they decided to drive out the communists altogether from the Korean peninsula. It is at that time, the Chinese intervened and fought against the United Nations forces. So, there was a chance that China would be, would be boycotted by the United Nations because of this. So, that is what uh, Sadar Patel was arguing for. Now, the next point is that India should also look into the situation in Nepal, Bhutan, Sikkim, Darjeeling 
and the tribal territories in Assam. Okay, so, there could be some internal disturbances created by China. As we saw later on, Chinese supported insurgent movements among the Nagas and the Mizos and even now China is encouraging insurgent movements within India. So, Sardar Patel was already aware of that and he was suggesting Pandit Nehru that he should look into this problem. Plus, look into internal security of Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Bengal and Assam. Then in order to send the Indian troops, you need better communications. So, you argued that there should be better road, rail and air and wireless communication okay, in order to facilitate our troops. And, and the Indian mission in Tibet, in Lhasa, uh, Gyantse and Yatung should be protected and Indian soldiers should be sent there to protect these missions. Okay, so, that was advocated. So, Sadar Patel did not advocate Indian withdrawal from Tibet. He said instead India should strengthen itself in Tibet to ensure that the Tibetan government is not crushed by the Chinese. And, uh, and finally, look into the McMahon line, ensure that the Chinese respect the McMahon line. So, these were some of the points raised by uh, Vallabhai Patel just before his death. But Nehru did not follow what, what uh, Sadar Patel argued. Pandit Nehru, he instead advocated uh, friendship with China. So, in 1954, he visited China. This is uh, uh, Nehru with Mao Zedong. And uh, basically, they signed an agreement, uh, agreement between the Republic of India and the People's Republic of China on trade and intercourse, in which Tibet was recognized as a region of China. Now, I had already mentioned that this was done by the British in 1914 and even before that, British has recognized Tibet as region of China. There is nothing wrong with this. Okay, this, this was already accepted. But in return, the British had forced the Chinese to accept the Shimla Convention and the 1904 Convention. Now, uh, this particular agreement, which is also known as the Panchashil, the famous Panchashil of Nehru, although uh, uh, it was actually first enunciated by Chou and Lai and, and it is called the Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence in China. So, uh, this basically undid whatever guarantees the British had got from the Chinese, basically the autonomy of Outer Tibet and the McMahon line. This undid everything, although it's, it does not mention it, by, by, but by accepting Tibet as a region of China without Chinese withdrawing their troops from there, it was de facto accepting the Chinese position. And India was sub then supposed to withdraw its military and all these advisors from Tibet. Uh, so, five principles are very famous, mutual respect for each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty, mutual non-aggression, mutual non-interference in each other's internal affairs, equality and mutual benefit and peaceful coexistence. These are the five principles of the Panchashil. In return, of course, the Chinese accepted, okay, India would, Indians would be allowed to trade. So, so from Bengal to Tibet, their uh, trade would, would continue and the Chinese will not harass the Indian traders. Similarly, the pilgrims would be allowed to travel to Kailash Mansarovar and, and many passes would be open so that people can easily travel. So, these uh, guarantees were given by the Chinese. So, in return for some trade and pilgrimage related guarantees, Nehru ceded strategic ground and gave China Tibet. This thing uh, uh, led to a response by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar in the Rajya Sabha in 1954. He said, our Prime Minister is depending on the Panchashil, which has been adopted by Comrade Mao. And the Panchashil, which is one of the clauses in the No Aggression Treaty on Tibet. I am indeed surprised that our Honorable Prime Minister is taking this Panchashil seriously. Honorable members of the house, you must be knowing that Panchashil is one of the significant parts of the Buddha Dharma. If Sri Mao had even an iota of faith in Panchashil, he would have treated the Buddhists in his country in a different manner. And he continued, Prime Minister will realize the truth in my words when the situation matures further. I do not really know what is going to happen. By letting China take control over Lhasa, the Prime Minister has in a way helped the Chinese to bring their armies on the Indian borders. 
any victor who annexes Kash Kashmir can directly reach Pathan court. And I know it for sure that he can reach the Prime Minister's house also. Now, this is another important comment, just like Sadar Patel's comment, which, which foresaw the future. Um, Ambedkar also saw that this would threaten India's situation in Jammu and Kashmir. And eventually, it could lead to Chinese launching a full-scale invasion of India. Okay, but Jawaharlal Nehru was at this moment in the height of his power. He was not ready to listen to anyone. And so, he further strengthened the position of China by sponsoring the Bandung Conference in Indonesia in 1955. This is uh, uh, Pandit Nehru with Cho and Lai, the Chinese premier. Okay. Uh, Mao was the chairman and, and Cho and Lai was the premier. He was the, also the foreign minister. Nehru was also the foreign minister. So, Nehru was the foreign minister of India, Cho and Lai was the foreign minister of China and both of them were also prime ministers. And so, in the Bandung conference, basically China received acceptance. It was attended by many countries from Africa and Asia and many of them did not recognize the People's Republic of China at that time. And uh, by inviting China and, and uh, giving Cho and Lai a platform, Nehru ensured that China would receive a recognition from most countries in Asia and Africa. And the Panchashil here was expanded to Dashashila. Dashashila means 10 principles, okay, which are again uh, similar in nature, basically uh, respecting each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty, equality of, of races, non-intervention, respect for the UN Charter. Uh, number 6 is very interesting. Number 6 says, abstention from the use of arrangement of collective defense. This was an attack on NATO. NATO had been formed in 1949, uh, not Atlantic Treaty Organization, to defend Europe from Soviet in invasion. Okay, so, so, they said that United Nations should be used for ensuring peace and security and not some other collective defense uh, organization. Interestingly, soon after the Bandung Conference, the Soviet Union also formed a collective defense organization called the Warsaw Pact. So, anyhow, these are some of the points in the Bandung Conference. But for us, the important thing is, People's Republic of China received recognition of the countries of Asia and Africa and it legitimized the communist rule in China. But uh, of course, the, the Chinese had some other um, intentions. And uh, this eventually led to the 1962 war. So, after this, we shall, we shall look into how uh, 1962 war started. Now, uh, to understand this, this uh, with a lot of uh, clarity, we need to actually study uh, some of the important books. So, I will mention uh, the, the names of this book. The most uh, famous one is India's China War by Neville Maxwell. Neville Maxwell was an Australian journalist in India. He covered this particular war. There are some tensions between him and the Indian government because he was critical of the Indian government. Now, it is uh, said that he, uh, he found a copy of the Henderson Brooks report. Henderson Brooks. Henderson Brooks was a British military officer in the Indian Army and Bhagat, Henderson Brooks Bhagat report. Now, this book is supposed to be based on this particular report. This was the report of the Indian Army, which was written after the defeat of the 1962 war. So, this was a top secret document. And uh, in, in 2014, he uh, Neville Maxwell, because he had grown old and he felt that he will die uh, very soon and so he basically uploaded this particular report in his blog, uh, so that people could download. Indian government tried to block it because it is a top secret document, but many people have downloaded this. So, his book is supposed to be based on this report, this part 1 and part 2. So, part 1 he uploaded, supposedly Indian government has not confirmed that this is the report. Part 2 is supposed to be basically memos and other, other supporting documents. So, the main arguments are in the, in the first part. 
Okay, so this is a very important book, and it 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 considers Nehru and the Indian government responsible for the 1962 war, and he also highlights all the defects in the Indian military preparation and how um, Nehru introduced this forward policy, which was foolhardy, and so on. Another important work that you should read is the Himalayan Blunder by uh, Brigadier Brigadier John Parshuram Dalvi. Now, Brigadier Dalvi served in, in, in the eastern sector. He was the commander of the brigade there. I think it was the 7th brigade. Now, his brigade was defeated by the Chinese and he along with his officers was taken prisoner of war. So, he was the highest ranking Indian officer to be taken prisoner by the Chinese army. They kept him for a few months in China. Um, uh, uh, but eventually he was released. Now once he returned, he wrote this book called the Himalayan Blunder. He subtitles it as the angry truth about India's most crushing military disaster. This was published in 1969 and in which he blames certain people. I am going to show you from the books you can say that these were some of the people who were responsible for India's defeat. So these are two old books, old classics which uh, uh, most people read in order to understand the 1962 war. In the recent years, there have been some other books. So uh, there are two good books that I would like to suggest. One is China's India War by Bertil Lindner. Okay, now this is the reverse of India's China War. In this book, Lindner basically blames China to be responsible for the war. And he looks into the internal dynamics, the external dynamics that led China to invade India. Okay, this was published in 2018. Another book is by Shiv Kunal Verma. It's called 1962, The War That Wasn't. Now, Shiv Kumar Verma is the son of a captain in, in, in uh, that 1962 war. Okay, his father Ashok Kalyan Verma was a captain at that time. Later on, he went on to become a, a general. I think he, he went up to the rank of lieutenant general. So, um, this is he was part of the, the famous debacle that the Indian uh, army faced at Namkachu in, in, in today's Arunachal Pradesh. So, this is also a very good book and it, 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 it does not restrict itself. This book goes into all the controversial points. Of, of the war and, and exposes all the reasons that, that China invaded India and all the mistakes made by the Indian establishment at that time. Okay, so let us look at uh, who are the people they have, that, that have been blamed basically for the debacle. Of course, the Prime Minister Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, he was the leader of India from the very beginning and he neglected the military. Okay, he believed that India is a peaceful nation, the nation of Gandhi and so India should not fight any war. There is no need to militarize India, no need for Indian army to be equipped with modern weapons. India did not have any aggressive intents toward any other country and therefore there, is, there was no need to be highly militaristic and through diplomacy India could solve all its uh, problems, all the security problems. And the person who was in charge of leading this diplomacy was V. K. Krishna Menon. V. K. Krishna Menon was a committed communist. Later on, uh, he became the defense minister of India. In the 1962 war, he was the defense minister. He neglected the military and, and uh, you know, the promotions were given to people based on who was close to Nehru or whom Nehru liked. And V.K. Krishna Menon facilitated all these. And of course, he as a communist, he also had a soft corner for China. He never uh, felt that China was a real threat to India. And uh, then we have General Pranath Thapar, who was the chief of army staff. Okay, he was the head of the Indian army. He, in the accounts, he is not actually held responsible, but he is not mentioned much. It seems that he was uh, uh, the, the chief of army staff because of his proximity to Nehru and he never really took 
uh, leadership hands on that he was not a very proactive chief and so therefore he is also considered responsible for uh, for uh, the debacle uh, he is also closely related to nehru nehru's family then another important person at that time was the the director of the intelligence bureau intelligence bureau at that time was the both the external and the internal intelligence agency of india today we have research and analysis wing which is the external intelligence agency but at that time intelligence bureau did both the internal and external intelligence and bholanath malik b n malik was the director of the intelligence bureau and uh, there was intelligence failure intelligence bureau was not able to report the chinese ag aggressive intent towards india and so this is also considered to be an intelligence failure but the person most blamed for the debacle was directly responsible for all the all the problems was lieutenant general bridge mohan call okay bridge mohan call was also a relative of nehru and he was promoted despite um, not actually ever leading a a platoon or even a, no question of leading a brigade he was, he had no battle experience he was mostly uh, head of supplies and so on and he never uh, really fought with the jawans before he was never even even during the second world war he he never was actively involved in combat but he was promoted and he was made the core commander in the eastern sector and he was not experienced and therefore he kept on pushing the troops to move forward okay he 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 basically felt that the uh, indian soldiers could just go on those heights without being equipped properly and drive out the chinese and when he was uh, forcing the indian soldiers to take on the chinese he retreated to delhi he was not there on the front and from delhi he was guiding the war and he was saying that he was ill and he was hospitalized and from his hospital room basically he was guiding the war so the henderson brooks report that that neville maxwell talks about uh, finds him to be most directly responsible for the debacle of the 1962 war okay so these are some of the people you can blame them more or less for the defeat of india in 1960 now let us look at the sequence of the war uh, i have already mentioned uh, the chinese invasion of tibet now once the chinese invaded tibet and the 17 points were agreed upon uh, nehru visited in 1954 and basically he legitimized the chinese control over uh, tibet now uh, the tibetan government was circumspect the americans the the cia central intelligence intelligence agency was in dialogue with the tibetan government tibetans were also expecting some help from india uh, but once uh, jawaharlal nehru visited china 1954 and he signed the panchashil agreement with china so the, uh, dalai lama and the tibetan government realized that there was no other hope for uh, tibet and so in 1955 dalai lama also visited peking and he met with the communist leaders and he was made a member of the communist party and the uh, the chinese national people's congress and so it seemed that the situation had normalized but mao of course was a revolutionary mao zedong was a revolutionary his intention was never to allow uh, tibet to remain so called backward and religious he wanted to introduce a uh, land reforms in 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 tibet just like any other part of china so uh when uh, initially the land reforms were done in china from 1949 to 1952 tibet was unaffected but then gradually uh the chinese government introduced more reforms they now they wanted to after redistributing land among the peasants now they wanted to collectivize the land uh, gradually first they began with mutual aid teams then cooperatives and then eventually people's communes were created which were collectivized entities so uh, as part of the land reform some reforms were introduced in tibet also land was redistributed 
and as a result the tibetans were agitated the tibetans did not want uh, such kind of land reforms and so in uh, 1956 khampa people okay let let me show you the, in the map so in the inner tibet let me show you uh, the other map here so in the inner tibet this area is amdo and this is kham this is the uh, western kham and this is the this is the western kham and this is the eastern kham so amdo was annexed by uh, china and the eastern kham was also annexed the people in the kham region are uh, are known as khampa these are uh, kind of a martial race both the uh, people in kham and amdo are martial races of tibet i already mentioned in the older lectures that uh, tibetans were a martial people they they had formed a great empire before becoming buddhist okay so when they came to india they were influenced by buddhism and then they converted to buddhism before that they were very violent warlike people so the khampas retained this martial tradition and so they were considered to be warriors the protectors of tibet and so they when the chinese began uh, land reforms this was a direct interference in the internal affairs of tibet and so they revolted in 1956 and they received support from the cia but the chinese were able to crush this particular revolt and soon after the dalai lama he visited uh, india uh, and he participated in many religious activities he was also accompanied by the pancham lama and it is said that during this time the dalai lama requested nehru for refuge in india he 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 asked him that he should be allowed to take shelter in india but at that time nehru was very friendly towards china so he rejected the request of the dalai lama he said that, that this could lead to escalation of violence and it could also lead to conflict between india and china and so dalai lama should not have these ideas in his mind and uh, chou enlai also visited india so in 1954 chou enlai visited india for the first time then he also visited in 1956 and he participated along with dalai lama and pancham lama in various festivities in india okay so it's from outside it seemed everything was hunky dory now uh, in 1958 mao launched the great leap forward now he was he did not want to follow the path of gradualism he wanted china to soon become a developed country he wanted to overtake britain in 15 years and challenge the united states in terms of steel production and also agricultural production so he, he believed that china is not as advanced as the soviet union but the chinese people have very strong will so with the help of the will of the chinese people china in 15 years could become developed and so he asked the chinese people to work hard mobilize themselves grow more uh, crops as well as produce steel in their own back backyards so this is known as the great leap forward which was a complete disaster okay the steel produced in the people's homes were substandard steel they were of no use people were melting their own uh, furniture and and uh, and and uh, household uh, crockery to to produce steel which was no use for uh, for industrial purposes in terms of agriculture also there was a lot of problem because there drought and fa and and uh, floods in china as a result uh, crops were damaged but the party carder kept on giving positive reports to the central government because they wanted to meet their targets there a lot of pressure to meet targets as a result the great leap forward was a complete disaster and it had its impact on tibet also okay many people in tibet died because of it in the end the great leap forward claimed about 30 million lives that is a kind of a median figure that that is accepted uh, people even say up to 45 million people died that is in indian uh, indian uh, uh, numerical system it is about uh, 4.5 crore people died because of the great leap forward Ma and mao zedong was directly responsible for this 
Anyhow, so the Tibetans were uh, fed up with, with the Chinese and on 10th of March 1959, they rose in revolt. They decided to overthrow the PLA. They had confidence that they will receive support from the West, which they did uh, to an extent. And Dalai Lama escaped to India. Okay, so he crossed the border and came over to India from the eastern side, crossing the Himalayas. He finally arrived in Tezpur in Assam. And soon he was he was supported by the Indian government. He realized in 1959 that he had made a mistake. And the Chinese assurances of, of no border problems with India were all false. And he accepted Dalai Lama in India and uh, uh, he formed a government in exile in, in Mussoorie and later on he shifted his headquarters to Dharamshala in Himachal Pradesh, today's Himachal Pradesh. The Chinese were very upset by this. Till then the Chinese believed that Nehru could be handled. Behind his back, behind the back of Nehru, the Chinese were calling him a running dog of the imperialists. He believed that Nehru was obedient towards the western imperialist powers. But on, on the face of Nehru, they were praising him. Okay, so this was a kind of a, a dualistic approach followed by the Chinese. And they believed that they could handle Nehru peacefully. But after uh, Nehru accepted Dalai Lama in India, they became more aggressive. And they began to attack Indian positions in 1959. Okay, there were some incidents. Uh, but by this time, uh, internally China was weak because of the Great Leap Forward. And China was actually not prepared to fight a war in 1959, uh, 1960, that period. And there was also a threat from Taiwan. Chiang Kai-shek was threatening to invade China and take over the rest of China. Uh, and so the Chinese were not willing to start a war with India. And uh, in April 1960, Chou Enlai, he proposed a swap of territory to Nehru. Basically, he said that India could keep Northeast Frontier Agency, that is today's Arunachal Pradesh, that is China will accept the McMahon line. But in return, Nehru should give up Aksai Chin. Okay, Aksai Chin uh, should be given to China. That meant that China would accept the McDonald McCartney line. Okay, that would become a boundary. But Nehru uh, wanted to take a more legalistic position. He said that India's uh, claims are clear and they are just. And therefore, justful uh, solution meant that Johnson line should be accepted. Both McMahon line and Johnson line should be accepted by the Chinese. And therefore, he rejected the offer of Chou Enlai to swap the territory. Now, Nehru was very confident because he had the support of Britain, America, as well as the Soviet Union. In fact, the situation between uh, China and Soviet Union was deteriorating at that time. Uh, in 1949, as I told you before, that Soviet Union supported the, the Chinese communists. And because of that, the communists came to power in China. And uh, China followed the policy of leaning on one side. So in the Cold War between US and Soviets, China would lean towards the Soviet Union. And Soviets sent a lot of aid, support, experts into China who helped them build machines and industries and technology and all that. But uh, once Stalin died in 1953, the new leadership under Khrushchev, they were not willing to help China unconditionally. And Mao was also not willing to be play as the, as the second rank power to the Soviet Union. And so there were a lot of tensions between the two. Eventually, this led to the Sino-Soviet threat. So the Soviet Union, in the, in the month of June 1960, they withdrew 1,400 experts who were advising the Chinese government. They were withdrawn by Khrushchev. And along with them, they carried all their blueprints. All the projects were stalled. Whatever projects were completed, were completed. But the incomplete projects were left just like that. And they also carried the blueprints with them so that the Chinese won't be able to complete these projects. And the Chinese communists were very upset because of that, because they felt that Soviet Union as a fellow communist country should support them. 
instead now soviet union was supporting india and now uh, the chinese signed uh, a border agreement with the burmese on 1st of october and in the interestingly in this particular border agreement i had shown you the line between uh, the mcmahon line extended not only to uh, it, it not only divided india with with china but also it it was a boundary between burma and and china and in this particular agreement chinese more or less accepted the mcmahon line so but in the case of india they were not willing to do unconditionally uh, and then there is another interesting incident 1961 february china crossed the burmese boundary so they had signed a uh, border agreement with burma but still they crossed the boundary because komintang the uh, chiang kai shek followers they were operating against the communist from across the border they had some bases in burma so the pla they crossed the boundary and destroyed the kmt bases so so that this meant that china was not willing to respect international agreements okay despite having an agreement with burma they still crossed the boundary in order to fight uh, their civil war and this made nehru realize that the situation had become dangerous uh, but instead of understanding the the weakness of the indian army because for 10 years nehru had not supplied weapons and machinery to the indian army so indian army was in no position to drive out the chinese but on 2nd of november 1961 he announced the forward policy he ordered the indian army to throw out the chinese from indian territory and there was a lot of support within india that okay we have to be patriotic we have to fight against the chinese we have to throw out the chinese and in response mao adopted a policy of armed coexistence that china won't move backwards but they will also not attack india so they will have arms they will be ready but they won't fight unless they have been attacked okay this policy is known as policy of armed coexistence another thing bolstered the the confidence of uh, pandit nehru that was the liberation of goa so uh, in 1961 in two days india defeated the portuguese who were the colonial powers in goa and daman and diu and and uh, they uh, they surrendered to the indian army and thus goa was liberated and goa became part of india so that gave lot of confidence to pandit nehru but it also created a kind of a, a anger in the west because uh, uh, west did not support use of force against we a western power portugal which was an ally of of america and britain i think portugal was also part of nato okay so although nato treaty did not cover the colonies but still it was a nato power that india had attacked and so it gave lot of confidence to pandit nehru now china was also uh, situation internal situation in china was also problematic because of the great leap forward uh, by this time mao was sidelined basically from the from the running of day to day government he was said that okay you remain the chairman of the of the party and you co control the military but the day to day government should go to the next generation of leaders because of the mistakes made in the great leap forward and mao wanted to return to the helm he wanted to reassert his authority and he felt that if he could use the military to give some success to china that will strengthen his position within the chinese government and so uh, in 1962 mid 1962 in the summer probes and skirmishes started happening between the indian army and the and the people's liberation army okay so uh, the indian army followed nehru's forward policy they they were trying to vacate the chinese from the indian territory on the other hand mao wanted to reassert his authority as a great military leader so he also asked the pla to continue occupying more and more territory and by october mao was ready to invade india now he also had knowledge about the cuban missile crisis okay so 13 days from 16th of october to 29th of october 
1962 was a period of great danger between US and Soviet Union. Soviet Union had placed nuclear missiles in, in Cuba and uh, Cuba is just across straits from uh, United States, just across Florida and from Cuba, Soviets could target American cities. Okay, and when the Americans discovered that the Soviets were installing missiles in Cuba, they basically blockaded the, the country. Now, Cuba was under Fidel Castro, which was a communist regime and therefore, they welcomed the Soviet Union. So, the Soviets tried to break the blockade and, and John F. Kennedy, the American president threatened a nuclear war. And this was a, uh, the closest the world came to a nuclear war between the two superpowers. And now Mao was aware of the situation because the Soviets wanted the support of the Chinese in case of war with America. So, Mao felt that this is the right time to invade India. So, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, he attacked India. So, this attack started uh, on the 19th of October, they started bombing the, the Indian positions. On 20th of October, Chinese launched a full frontal attack against the Indian army, both across the McMahon line and also in, in Aksai Chin. And the Soviets at that time kept quiet because they uh, had to support the Chinese because they needed Chinese help against in case there is a war with the West. And the West was also busy with the Cuban Missile Crisis. So, Mao as, uh, as a military genius understood that this is the right time to invade India. And Indian army was completely ill prepared. Okay, so, Tawang, which is a very important uh, uh, place in, in Arunachal, uh, it, is, it is a very important uh, center for Tibetan Buddhism. The sixth Dalai Lama was born in Tawang and the monastery there was founded by the great fifth Dalai Lama. So, Tawang is very important from a Tibetan Buddhist point of view. So, within four days, Tawang fell. And once uh, Tawang fell, Chinese stopped the fighting, okay, because at that time, Cuban Missile Crisis was also getting resolved and the Chinese felt that they had taught Nehru a lesson. So, I, Nehru would accept their position. So, I think the time is running out for today. So, I will stop here and we will continue the discussion in the next lecture and we will continue uh, uh, discussing the events that followed the 1962 war. Thank you. Hello, welcome to the 20 hour course on introduction to Chinese studies. I am Saurabh Sharma, assistant professor in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Chanakya University, Bangalore. Before this, I was assistant professor of political science in the Rajiv Gandhi National University of Law, Punjab. I have studied Chinese studies from the center for East Asian Studies, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. I basically teach political science and international relations to undergraduate students. So, this course offers you some basic ideas on China that I have learned over the years from teachers of Chinese studies as well as from my own experience interacting with Chinese scholars as well as visiting China. In this particular course, there, there are 20 lectures. You can see this is the list of the lectures that we have. Let me briefly go through this list. First lecture would be on the of Chinese in which I talk Chinese civilization began, how it began 
and what are the main ideas that constituted Chinese civilization. Thank you.